Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Happy Friday, Food Junkies listeners. Today we have a treat for you as Dr. Vera Tarman interviews Dr. Gary Fetke. But before we get to our guest, I wanted to remind you all that Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction by Dr. Tarman is available for purchase on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. We also wanted to be sure you're getting the most support you can by joining Dr. Tarman's Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. Be sure to check the show notes for all the links. Now about today's guest. Dr. Gary Fecky is an orthopedic surgeon practicing in Tasmania, Australia. He has a major interest in preventative medicine and encourages his patients to lose weight before undergoing surgery. Although his specialty is surgery, Gary believes it's much better to help people avoid surgery if at all possible by taking preventative measures, which often include and involve altering the diet. In recent years, Gary has focused on the role of diet in the development of diabetes, obesity, and cancer. He has been speaking out on the combined role of sugar, fructose, refined carbohydrates, and polyunsaturated oils linking together to be behind inflammation and modern disease. He has incurred the wrath of regulatory bodies for his stand on public health, but he and his wife, Belinda, whom we interviewed in episode nine, remain active defending the benefits of low-carb, healthy fat living. Their ongoing work has uncovered vested interest in ideology shaping nutritional guidelines at an international level. In this episode, Dr. Fecky shares his personal story. Sugar and orthopedic disorders are discussed. Dr. Fecky's investigation is talked about a bit. We talk about the pushback Dr. Fecky receives. We find out what's next for him. He answers our signature question and so much more. Take it away, Vera. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your co-host today along with Molly Painshaw. Today we talk to Dr. Gary Fecke, an Australian orthopedic surgeon whose prime goal is to help patients avoid their surgery by first changing their diet. I don't need to say that Dr. Fecke is a most un- unusual orthopedic surgeon. Gary is also the author of two books, Inversion, One Man's Answer to Peace and Global Health, and Nutritional Model of Modern Disease. Along with his wife, Belinda, this couple challenged the Australians' healthy eating guidelines, which they claim supports a high-carb, unhealthy lifestyle. They created an alternative Nutrition for Life Diabetes and Health Research Center, which advocates an alternative low-carb nutritional platform. Both individuals suffered professional consequences due to their advocacy, and Food Junkies interviewed Belinda two years ago, and now it is time to talk to Gary. Because of Gary's promotion of the low-carb diet, the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency actually challenged his qualifications to give nutritional advice. Oh yes, he could do surgery, but on threat of deregulation, the Medical Board of Tasmania cautioned that he was not allowed to, quote, provide specific advice or recommendations on the subject of nutrition and how it relates to the management of diabetes and the treatment or prevention of cancer. What kind of medicine is that? Of note, Gary has been cleared of all these charges and has even been issued a formal apology from this agency. So hello, Gary. We're very interested in this story and your your story. (laughs) Good morning here. I think it's good afternoon there. Yeah, thank you. So we always like to get a bit of the personal before we get into sort of your thinking and conceptual guidelines. How did you get into orthopedic medicine and then low carb? Simply, I suppose, I had an interest in sport, played a lot of sport, had an interest in science, and that led me down the path of medicine. I was then going to do sports medicine, but then found out if you really want to do something in sports medicine, then do orthopedics, which means actually laying the hands on and actually doing something. I was traumatized twice in my formative years I suppose once when I was 16 my last year of school when my mother died and she died because an orthopedic surgeon had missed the diagnosis and she had a raging cancer he was she was told oh you've just got a sore knee don't worry about it mm. didn't even do an x-ray and then four months later she died from a widespread metastatic cancer so that was right at a critical point in time when I was deciding which career path I want. So I've got to admit that that was probably a big push in towards doing medicine. And then a, a screw up by the medical profession. 
And you've, you've, you've mentioned Belinda, you've interviewed her. What you can't see on camera is that she's missing her index finger. I tend to extend my middle finger a lot to the system, but she can't extend her middle finger because it, her index finger is not there. And when we were only going out for a year, she had some surgery on that from an old trauma. And again, the medical profession screwed up and they ignored both her mother and her and her pain and her allergy to iodine and insisted they hadn't used iodine and she ended up with gangrene in the finger. So I said, the two people I've loved the most, my mother and my wife, have been traumatised and injured by the medical profession. Informative times for me. So I've, I've never been one to not speak up because if you don't speak up and you don't question, then you've got, and you've got, you've seen the byline from me and on my email that science evolves by being challenged, not by being followed. Mm. And if it doesn't seem right, doesn't make sense, or you're clearly seeing bad outcomes, and then do something about it. The very first thing is question. So you know, that, that's, I suppose that's in a nutshell what has got me down that path of medicine, but it's also got me down that path of advocacy. Yeah. What about the low carb folk? I mean, for our listeners, this is unheard of in the orthopedic world. Like- oh, well, that, that's just purely selfish. I mean, I've had my health issues over time. I was a fat kid. I, 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 look, I was clearly a food addict. I still think I am a food addict. And I was, uh, I went through, I had my own cancer story and I was obese. I'm 20 kilos, 45 pounds down on now on my peak weight. I was also having high blood pressure. I was having a little heart issue. Uh, I was pre-diabetic in retrospect, and I thought, I'm going to get healthy. So I went and, you know, sort of eat by the dietary guidelines and all that happened and, and exercise more, you know, trying to outrun a bad diet. And guess what? It didn't work. I just got fatter and a bit sicker and nothing changed. So I'm in the, you know, and it wasn't as though, and okay, sure, I did sneak in a bit of chocolate, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't horribly bad. I was actually eating my cereals and grains and fruit and whole grain, you know, breads and... Uh, yeah, that traditional healthy diet. Well, the food pyramid diet. Yes. And so therefore, I often now say, I explained to you this cough is actually because I was helping out with moving sheep yesterday and I've been filled, my lungs have been filled with dirt and manure. Our dog, when I got home last night, thought it was quite enchanting because it could smell you know, lamb and uh, manure <laughs> all over me. So uh, yeah, I have this saying about the food pyramid. If you, if you eat by the food pyramid, I think you're going to die by the food pyramid and along the way you're going to look like the food pyramid. And, you know, that, that society, we, we really see that. So I, 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 my own journey was I started looking into this and it didn't make sense. I'm very proud of the fact that I described this nutritional model of inflammation and modern disease, which is that combination of sugar, refined carbohydrates and polyunsaturated oils, which all come together in a perfect storm. And I did that in 2013. Now, that is almost commonplace to hear that now. But I can remember putting that jigsaw piece together or that those pieces together with few other people around the world this five person four continent email on an easter weekend and i went oh four letter word i think i think i've got something here and then we bounced it off and they said actually this could be the missing link when you put them together so i mean i started off on the sugar thing where i looked at cancer and that cancer clearly is affected by sugar metabolism i'll I'll, I'll leave it at that at this point in time but i started okay and i had my cancer story so i started looking into sugar and then fructose in particular and just for listeners, you started off with a cancer story and then your cancer is now in remission because you changed your diet? Definitely. I don't think you can ever get rid of uh, the tumour that I have. It's, I've clearly slowed its growth. Uh-huh. Like it was growing at a certain rate and that clearly slowed, almost stopped. But, yeah. I, don't, but, but I still have an active tumour there, but it hasn't gotten the better of me. I'm, I'm, I'm now 23 years down the path of that diagnosis, so I'm, I'm, I'm still here and still shouting from the rooftops. And then I started looking at the role of seed oils and the polyunsaturated seed oils and how they can become oxidised and part of an inflammatory process. And then the, the big turning point for me was refined carbohydrates and this thing called a polyol pathway. So when glucose and carbohydrate gets converted, it get, normally gets con- there's a thing called a polyol pathway which will convert a portion of it back to fructose. And I thought that was the runaway train in the whole equation, which I still think it is. Anyway, so you've got to imagine living with me because I, you know, at that point in time, and now today you can just go, look, I'm going to do low-carb keto and take all of those out of the house. But I, I came home to Belinda and I said, actually, we're going to stop eating sugar. Sugar is going to go. And then she said, okay, so I was ripping through the pantry and getting rid of all that. And, and the kids were you know, looking in wonderment at what dad's doing. He's lost the plot again. 
And then I said, actually, now, then the next step is I worked out that you've got to get rid of the seed oils. You know, so the, the polyps, so I was going through all the seed oils and the vegetable oils and anything you could find with a vegetable oil in it had to go. Because like, here's a little you know, snippet, the half-life of linoleic acid, which is one of the omega-6 seed oils, and probably the inflammatory one, has a half-life of four years. Wow, four so years. So you, you might think you're going to change your lifestyle dramatically, but this oxidation product and its inflammatory properties are still going to hang, be hanging around in four years' time. Belinda's sister has had a you know, dramatic health improvement. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS. She doesn't have it. She mm-hmm. changed to this diet and ultimately, uh, literally almost four years to the day, things improved. Now, again, that's anecdotally, but again, it's not proof, but it's just all, it's interesting how all these things tend to align with what is, what is theory. So wait a second, let me just back, backtrack. So you're saying that her MS, which was a diagnosed MRI lesions MS, put no, into... No, no, it, it was... It was, it was Equivocal on MRI. Yeah, okay. Because there's different forms of MS. Yes. So, But her symptoms and everything, and she was being managed down that pathway. And she's fine now. Like it hasn't yeah. progressed. That's no, not, not, not progressed. It's actually gone away. Wow. And, 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 and her story is not alone. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm allowed to tell her this because yeah. I'm allowed to. You know, all of the family members, you know, whether or not they're sisters or children of, you know, and even in-laws and parents have all gone, oh, he's completely lost the plot, but they all slowly come around and wait at this because you can't, you lead by example. One of my sisters is an intensive care nurse and has had her problems with autoimmune disease. And she thought, you know, here I am, you know, she's a bit like the medical board, think, how can my brother-in-law actually an orthopedic surgeon know anything about nutrition? So she thought she, I'd lost the plot. And then ultimately I said, well, look, it's your problem. You, you, you don't have to do anything. I'm just telling you this is an option. Anyway, so you know, she, she did it and she got better and, you know, yes. and I went. Go back to your story. I, I... So, and then, so I got rid of the, the seed oils came out of the house and then I worked out this, this third link, which is poly, you know, refined carbohydrates and how it all fitted into the biochemistry. And those talks were on YouTube because I've, I get, I got into trouble. One of the reasons I got in trouble with the medical board was actually I was making things too simple. I said I was explaining it so people could understand it. And then the medical board said, no, you're not allowed to explain things so people can understand it. I'm not making this stuff up, you know, it's just crazy, but that's you know, the criticisms I was getting. Anyway, so that was it. I came home one day and Belinda said, you know, I'd, I'd gotten rid of sugar, polyunsaturated oils, the carbs out of the, out of the pantry. She was wondering what nurse to feed the kids. She said, you take the bacon out of the house, you're out as well. <laughs> anyway, so thank goodness I stopped at that point in time. There was enough damage done. Karen Zinn, who's a dietitian in New Zealand, has got a great term. It's called empty, empty pantry, full fridge. And yeah. I think that's really what we're advocating, you know. And so, you know, this whole stand of mine is very much an ancestral diet. I've described it in one sentence, which is really we should be eating fresh, local, seasonal, whole food based on our culture and environment, avoiding added sugar and processed food. Now, I actually think that should be the dietary guidelines for the world. It's all encompassing. It's really talking about what's freely available in your environment, realizing that there are vast tracts of the world that are not privileged enough to have that, including you know, major cities which are now food deserts. And, and it may not be easy to get that, but that, if, from a purely a pure perspective of how we evolved, that's what we did. We got to the top of the food chain by eating this evolutionary diet. By definition, when you break that down, I've also described low-carb. That's a diet that is rich in low-carb foods, healthy fats. It is an animal-based protein and fat diet animal-based micronutrients, and it has low environmental impact. So there's a lot in that packed into that sentence, but it is actually a call to arms about how we should be eating. Yes. And it's not arguable. I, mean, I, can't, I can't lose an argument. A National Health and Medical Research Council, that sentence, we're in the process of reviewing the dietary guidelines here at the moment in Australia, and they have a budget of 15 or 20 million. I said, look, for 3 million, you can just have my one sentence. <laughs> right. I'll save you a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but the US dietary guidelines have been reviewed a couple of times, in the, you know, the, and it, you know, it's, it's a complete schmozzle, and there's vested interests in there, and you can take apart those committees to work out what hat they're wearing. Same thing here in Australia. It's very hard to create unbiased dietary guidelines. But I think that sentence, and I realise that's the arrogance of a, of, a, of a surgeon, that's it. One sentence can describe what we need to eat to survive for our health, well-being, and for the longevity of ourselves, our children, and our planet. It's up to you to how you interpret it, 
but it certainly doesn't mean going out and actually factory farming, ploughing up vast tracts of land to actually rip the nutrients out of the soil. And it's, it's a holistic pathway, but it's our ancestral one. It's the one that, one that does actually work. And it works biochemically. Okay. Hey, can I, I, I wonder if I could take advantage of your orthopedic background and just steer away for a minute to the way that, because a lot of people don't really know this, how does sugar and refined carbohydrates and seed oils contribute to not necessarily cancer, or, or, but, but just orthopedic issues like arthritis? Well, we can take the general aspect that that combination I, I, creates inflammation yes. in every blood vessel and every organ of the body of which bones and joints just are the parts of the body. So it, that's the inflammatory model of modern disease. That, that fits across the whole lot. Very specifically, when you look at, and there's some great stuff which has come out in the last few years, and specifically something out of China in 2020. So not everything bad came out of you know, China in 2020. And it was a great study looking at the role of insulin in, in osteoarthritis of the knee. So insulin is that oh. hormone that the pancreas produces when your blood glucose goes up and it's there. Insulin is to drive glucose out of your bloodstream and into your tissue and store it. But insulin is also a, a growth hormone, tumour-promoting hormone, so high levels of insulin, high rates of cancer. But yes. what that Chinese group came up with is it actually showed that it increases inflammation in the knee joint. I was going to actually ask you to focus on knee and hip because those yeah. are like the big surgery so, procedures. Oh, massive, massive. So the synoviocytes, which is the lining of the knee joint and it produces a, in, the joint fluid, becomes more inflamed when your insulin levels go up and it drops down when your insulin levels go down. Now, the, the Chinese paper showed that beautifully and it was a human study. But what they, they missed the point was because their conclusion was, oh, we need to target insulin in the management of osteoarthritis. No, if you don't eat sugar and carbs, your insulin levels will come down and your body and your inflammation will settle. So again, in my practice, those people with osteoarthritis of the knee, I'd encourage them to go low carb, give up your sugar and carbs and come back and see me. And I, I tell this story because I know it's true because I put it on Twitter. Where I, had, you know, I had one week where I saw eight people that I'd seen six to eight weeks beforehand. And, those, and I said to them all, look, you've all got osteoarthritis of your knee, you've got a bare bone in your knee. I'd really want you to do low carb before we think about surgery. And I had eight patients come back in to, to see me in that two-month period who'd all lost their pain. They wow. still had an X-ray of bare bone. They hadn't lost any appreciable amounts of weight and they, their pain had gone away, which is what that's the game is, isn't it? Yes. And so... You know, I, you know, I was seeing this every week, but to get eight back in a few days, and one was a physiotherapist of slight build. She'd been working with me over the years. She didn't know, want to lose weight. She didn't need to lose weight. But she said, look, I really don't want a knee replacement because anybody who's had a knee replacement, it's a horrible experience. You know, it's hard work. It, you know, there's a long recovery. You're never perfect after it. Though some people are, but most people, are, you know, it's, it, you're, mm. you're significantly better, but you're not perfect. So she came back in about six weeks later and she was a bit cranky with me because she'd lost half a kilo. But she said, I've got no pain. I've climbed up Cradle Mountain over the weekend. I wanted to prove this. Now, these eight people, and it's, it's not eight, but it's hundreds, but these eight people in that one-week period would have, if they'd seen any of my colleagues already had their knee replacement, half knee replacement, full knee replacement. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I speak up at orthopedic meetings as well. My, it's interesting. I'm not seen to be nearly as crazy as I was ten years ago. You know, it, it's coming around. It's 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 like a you know a big oil freighter that's taking its time to come around. But the, the, we're gaining some merit in that. And the, the, you know, I think we can possibly talk about where all this is heading down the track. But yeah, so so getting... but if our wish list was correct and and we could get people on a low carb or at least unrefined carb diet, we could probably cut significantly cut the hip and knee replacement. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. If you look in, so that's in cartilage, in cartilage, yes, in the lining of cartilage, which is the synoviocytes, insulin is directly related to inflammation. If we look at the cartilage itself and the damage within the cartilage, damage to the glycoaminoglycans in there, that's actually damage related to the byproducts of carbohydrate metabolism, not protein, mm. it's not fat. It's not micronutrients, it's byproducts of glucose metabolism. So if we actually look at the cartilage within, and we look at the tendons in the body, we find that the damaging material in there are byproducts of carbohydrate metabolism. 
But in a, if we, a historical sense, pre-agricultural revolution had very low rates of osteoarthritis. So you can look at skeletons from 10 to 15,000 plus years ago, their yeah. rates of osteoarthritis, not zero, but very low rates. And I've got a friend of mine who's gone to Spain to look at ancient skeletons, and they can say, oh, pre-agricultural revolution, post-agricultural revolution. Mm. They can just pick it because of the, the bone structure. Well, you could make the argument. So what do you say? Those are people who died much younger. We're living much older. So what do you say to that? Like those, the, are those skeletons, you know, 40-year-olds or are they 80-year-olds? So it's the same. You, you see those inflammatory changes in the bone now. Uh, yeah. We're, we're, our life expectancy, we've had octogenarians for thousands of years. Even then. Yeah, so the fact that we're living, our mean life expectancy is going up. I'll argue it's because of better antenatal care and that we've got a medicated older population now. Yeah. But we've had octogenarians for thousands of years when you look at those skeletons. So we've actually been able to look at skeletons of old aged people. Okay, I just wanted to play the devil's yeah. advocate here. There. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Um, I, there's a book I read called Oh, it's a while ago, but it's called 1000. So, you know, like all of the material related to what all knowledge in the year 1000 fits into one filing cabinet. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, it's distinct from, you know, there's more written, there's more in your background picture here of, of your file, of your books, than there is in the entire knowledge of the world at the year 1000. Mm. But one thing about it is our height at that point in time was about the same as it is now. And it's through the Middle Ages that our heights and health dropped down. And arguably that's because of our movement in towards cities, our hygiene, health, food availability and violence, actually, because we went from nomadic herders. We, 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 so that, you know, between, you know, 1200 and, well, we could probably say 2023, but anyway, let's say, you know, the 1800s, 1900s, we, we, we didn't have the health benefits that we... Okay. What about osteoporosis? Is there, uh, does, does sugar or fine carbs affect bone density? Yes and no. That, I mean, that's a vague answer. If you're in a low-grade chronic inflammatory state with high bone turnover, then yes, it is associated with bone. If you have a diet which is low in healthy fats and you have poor bioavailability of vitamin D, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, and that's because we've, you know, we've covered up our bodies, we're inside a lot, we're in temperate climates, we don't have access to sun, and we have a diet that doesn't have a healthy amount of vitamin D in it, and again, vitamin D comes from animal fats predominantly and sunlight, but you've got to get the precursors of there. So therefore, if your diet's not right, you'd have a higher rate of osteoporosis. However, have I been able to prove or find evidence that sugar causes that? No. But I think by, by incidence, it's there. Okay. It sounds to me, you've said a couple of times that your, your emphasis on uh, animal diets. I, what's your take then on somebody who wants to be vegetarian? Is it possible to have a healthy vegetarian diet for bone health or just in general? I think a, a well-constructed, well-supervised, highly supplemented vegetarian diet will be, you can continue on with. However, it will be deficient in some essential proteins, essential fats, it will be deficient in micronutrients, particularly in iron. And so the major push towards this vegetarian diet is fascinating because where has it come from? So if, you, if, if there's a massive promotion for something which is deficient in our health equation, in our diet, then it's clearly got nothing to do with science. And therefore, that's where we've started looking sideways. Now, I mean, my story is I got targeted by the food industry Yes, and indirectly by the cereal industry, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, in promoting a, a story and a method and a management option of preventative health. So, in the process of that, that's where Belinda's works come in, and I think you know, you, you're you're somewhat aware of that. Where she started going, well, he's going blue in the face talking about the science. My colleagues in this space in the low carb keto world were going blue in the face talking about the science. I'm now getting targeted by the system, therefore. What is it? So we thought it was originally going to be the sugar industry or maybe the carbohydrate industry or the processed food industry, but as it turned out, it was the proponents of the, of the anti-meat industry. Because if we're talking about low-carb, and you know, I described it before, that means it's anti-vegetarian. Mm -hmm. It's pro-meat. And so therefore, a lot of the pushback as it came from is actually coming from the vegetarian movement. So a lot of our work has actually been to work out, okay, know thy enemy and work out why on earth they actually so I'm, you can, everyone everyone is entitled to their opinion and rather than just say to someone i think your opinion is wrong 
we spent an enormous amount of time trying to work out how to develop their opinion. So it's a bit like guideline committees. Okay, okay you come in, we tend to know, like to know which hat people are wearing. I'd like to know what hat Vera Tarman is wearing. I'd like to know what hat Molly Painshed's wearing, even if they don't know what hat you're wearing. And so where does your education come from? Where's your family from? Where have you heard about vegetarianism being good? Where have you heard about it being bad? Where does it come from? Because I think the biochemistry can't lie. At a cellular level, our cells require macronutrients and micronutrients. They need a complete set of them to draw from. Okay. So that, that's the science. Now, that comes from our evolutionary diet, which is animal-based. Plants are incomplete, so, and we've really only been talking about this plant-based diet and a plant-based push for less than 100 years. So therefore, okay, wh- where is it coming from? So there's two sides. There's the Eastern vegetarianism and there's Western vegetarianism. So, and then there's vegan. So to be, so from an Eastern vegetarian aspect, there's multiple religions around the world, particularly in the Asian societies, which Eastern vegetarianism, but they are not Eastern vegan. They're not, 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 not vegan. They are animal products in their diet. And it may be in the vast majority of it, and it might be that they're having some ghee, they're having their lards, they're having their animal products from that. And then when an animal gets old and dies, they boil it up and they do, they do have the products of it and it's treated with respect. But on an ongoing basis, you have need to understand that the vast majority of Asian societies which are on these vegetarian diets are iron deficient. Mm. Iron deficient anemia is a massive problem throughout Southeast Asia. So they do have an iron deficiency, well documented, and they've also got a rapidly increasing rate of obesity and diabetes because of the push now towards actually bringing the refined carbohydrates, the grains, the cereals into those those communities yeah. and making them staples rather than side dishes. So the side dish of rice used to be you know, that it, now it becomes a staple. And the seed oils are now coming into the system as well. And you know, we, the advice now for China is that they are actually taking this Western advice to move towards more cereals and grains and the Chinese now are developing their Western plains into corn and, and, and wheat and cereal production and canola. Right. You know, I, I, we talk about the rise and fall of China. I mean, that's a way, that's a big demographic call I'm making here, but they are developing what's left of their Western plains for agriculture. They are now just creating an inflammatory model, which is only going to catch up with them in the next 30 to 50 years. Okay. I, mean, I won't be around to you know call that one out, but I, that's my you know prediction into the future. So tell us about the Western vegetarianism. The Western vegetarian, like- well, again, that's the one which is influencing us on a day to day basis. Yeah. And as it turns out, that Western vegetarianism is all comes from pretty well the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Now everyone goes, who's the Seventh Day Adventist Church? So you know that you may or may not know about them, but they effectively are the second biggest educator in the world after the Catholic Church. They have started and largely own the cereal industries of the world, the soy industries of the world, the alternate meat industries of the world, and the stevia industry. So they position themselves right across the world, but particularly in developing nations. And they have the beliefs of uh, their prophetess, Ellen G. White, and which is all temperance movement concepts back in the 1840s to 1860s, where people were moving from the country into the cities. There was impurities in a whole lot of aspects, men were moving into the cities. They were drinking more because you had to, you couldn't drink the water because mm-hmm. water was you know, was fouled. So therefore, that's where the you know, beer, the mees, you know, low alcoholic drinks came from because that created a sterilising process. So people would come to the cities, they'd drink more, everything with troubles. Food that was being transported in was rotten, so meat was rotten, so therefore it was highly salted. There becomes part of the myth of salt mm-hmm. and meat problems being troublesome was actually a transport issue, not actually a problem with salt, not actually a problem with meat. Anyway, Ellen G. White was born into that thing and the Seventh-day Adventist Church was invented, you know, developed in that time frame. And she had an interpretation of the Bible and, and the, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible is quite different from the St. James Bible, for instance. It's completely reworded in, 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 in critical points. And the birth of that was that the, essentially the belief is that the more once the world's population moved towards veganism, at least have heard about it and moved towards it, then Christ will return mm-hmm. to the Saviour of 144,000 Seventh Day Adventists. Now that's fine for you to have that belief. Okay, people can have whatever they believe, but that shouldn't 
then become the dietary guidelines that are fed to my children or the children in schools, the patients in hospital, and become the dietary guidelines for the Western civilization. Now, they've spent over 100 years working in this space. And so the that, vegan is like the forefront of that. Well, the vegans actually don't realize that they've become no, I see that. Re- re- religious foot soldiers. Right, but you just described it as that. Really, I have. But when you actually believe, when you realise that the terms like meat causes cancer, Mm -hmm. it comes from Ellen G. White, and maybe she probably meant cancer of the soul, but it sort of got into the narrative. Meat causes violence again. Mm -hmm. Meat causes masturbation, which was the primary problem there. That's because if you masturbate, that's the vilest sin, and you'll never go to heaven. And then that morphed into meat causes heart disease, and then that's morphed into meat causes environmental damage mm-hmm. and environmental harm. This all has the beginnings of Adventist health messaging for, we, for us to move down the pathway of actually the all becoming vegan vegetarian. Now, when you're, So here in Australia, we've got sanitarium, wholly owned by the church, highly processed food industry, vertically integrated as well as horizontally integrated into the farming industry and into the pharmaceutical industry. The same thing happens in the US. You've got a big company called Kellogg's. So, and virtually all of the cereal industries of the all of the cereal companies in the world had their were established in around 1895 to 1910 in a place called Battle Creek, Michigan, all with very strong Adventist beliefs and beginnings. And good luck to them; they've taken their business model. But then, in 1917, Lena Cooper, who was working with John Harvey Kellogg in the development of cereals and the Battle Creek Sanitarium, she became the very she started the American Dietetics Association. She then was principal, the author of the dietetics textbooks for the Western world for the next 40 years. She was the first influential dietitian within the Defence Department. And as a result of that, all Western Dietetics Associations, which have been influential in food guidelines, are all byproducts of one myth that started in 1917, October 23, 1917. And so it's all there in history. Yeah, it's really interesting. And, 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 and Lena Cooper, she, right. she was influenced by Ellen G. White because we're going back to 1860s. But, they, you know, John Harvey Kellogg, brilliant man by all accounts, but he was the one who started developing breakfast cereal to stop us all from masturbation. Now, okay. it, it's, it, you can't make this up, but I, I say to people, don't, don't believe me, just Google cereal and masturbation when no one's looking. You know, don't, don't use your work phone, you know, just use them. <laughs> and the name John Harvey Kellogg will come up. I just want to bring us to our uh, also one of the subjects that you mentioned that, that we're always interested in. You said that you were a food addict. And one of the things I think, as you described the story of the American dietetics, whenever we talk to dietitians, they're very adverse to this concept of food addiction. And I wonder if there's some, if we want to bring this to today, you know, we're very convinced that food addiction exists. It sounds like you do too. Could this explain some of the resistance that we receive with this concept? Nobody ever likes to admit they're addicted to something. Uh-huh. But I'll, I'll drag it back to one word. It's called fructose. Yes, go ahead. So the metabolism of fructose, so gl- sugar is half glucose, half fructose. There are effectively only two carbohydrates. One's glucose, one's fructose. And then there's repeating molecules of that to whether or not you call it glucose or uh, uh, sugar or galactose. or it, it, It's literally or maltose. It's yeah. literally just repeating molecules. Complex carbohydrates are just repeating molecules of yeah. the two simple ones. We know a lot about glucose metabolism. We're still learning about it. That's what I mean, 2020, finding out glucose metabolism in, in joints and in tendons. Fructose metabolism, however, is brand new, effectively. We, it was definitively described in 2010 by a fellow by the name Happy in Switzerland. A lot of work in there, but it's, it's, so it's, not in, it's not in my textbooks. It's not in your textbooks. You know, you've got to look in fructose metabolism, when fructose, fructose 6-phosphate, and then disappears out of knowledge. So one of the things about fructose is I think it actually drives behaviour and does that along different pathways. It, essentially, it makes you hungry. So one of the pathways has an anti-leptin effect. So leptins are hormones secreted by the fat in the body. And when you've got plenty of fat on board, you're secreting plenty of leptin, that has a feedback loop to the brain, the hypothalamus, saying don't eat anymore. Fructose comes along and inhibits the leptin effect on the brain. So you lose that ability. And I'll give a practical examples of this in a second. The second thing that fructose does, it has a positive ghrelin effect. And ghrelin is a hormone secreted in your stomach, which makes your tummy rumble. So it stimulates that. Now, apart from some other insulin resistance effects, which it'll have at the muscle level and in the liver, 
just at an anti-leptin positive ghrelin effect, that will make you hungry. Now, fructose in nature is high in fruit, you know, high levels in fruit. It's there in fruit, it's in honey. Uh, look, the natural sources of carbohydrate which are available to us are fruit, honey if you want to go into a wild beehive and climb the tree and rip it down, good luck to you, and in breast milk. You know, like it's, there's very little carbohydrate in nature. We talk about grains, but then early agricultural dental changes showed that their teeth were all missing because they were trying to actually grain with their teeth. They, they didn't, they, they just lost their teeth. So that, you know, early, earliest recollections were actually fermenting grains into beer and bread you know, mm-hmm. 14,000 years ago. So that it was actually, they were processing the grain at that point in time to make it biologically available. So fructose will drive behavior. Now, if fruit is naturally available, so you will have at the beginning of end of summer, beginning of autumn, the fruit trees ripen. Here in Australia, we've got possums, you've got whatever, where your local wildlife will come through and they'll strip the tree bare in a night, day before you want to take the fruit off the tree, because the animal will have its behaviour driven by it. There's no way that animals can eat that much food on a day-to-day basis. But what happens is all of those appetite suppressant effects are driven out of the way because the animal, the wild side of us, will know that if we eat that fruit, which is high in sugar, high in fructose, we will convert that into fat for our winter hibernation. So that is the feeding frenzy of fructose. Wow, that's the feeding frenzy of food addiction. Well, it, it is, but it's just, just yes. fructose. Yes. Now, if we, if yes. we then throw in an inflammatory side to that, to the brain, with our throw in the seed oils and the, that other combination of, then an inflamed brain is less able to reason. So it's going to come more back down to our basic and our primitive responses. So in nature, fruit is highly addictive. It advertises itself by being bright, shiny, red, orange, yellow. It's higher in sugar because it's when its sugar content goes up and it gets brighter and riper. We are, a, our eyes will see it. We will innately go to it to explore it. We'll then test it and then we're gone because then the fructose will get in and we'll drive that behavior. It's a good thing in nature, in survival. It's a good thing for us to be addicted to fruit. And it's a good thing for us to get fat for winter hibernation if for the rest of the year we didn't have food availability. But the trouble is we've got supermarkets open nearly 24 hours a day. You know, and we know, we know that there's a, a panic and a feeding frenzy because, you know, on Christmas Day our supermarkets close here in Australia and on Good Friday. But you look at the, the, the shopping frenzy on Christmas Eve, you know, the two days before Christmas, you know, houses are bulging out in food because they weren't able to get food on Christmas Day. We become incredibly irrational when it comes to our food supply because we're innately driven to actually store it, hold it, find it because it's our survival mechanism. Right. Very primitive. So is it food addiction or is it just a primitive re- response? I think it's a primitive response. It's a primitive response that the food industry has really capitalised on. Absolutely. And, uh, Yeah, and unless we, I mean, we can start talking about the solution, unless we recognize that in the way that you've described it, we're just driven by the food industry manipulations. But the solution is to step out of that. The the solution is to make yourself aware, become informed, educated, all of that. So, I mean, I still eat some fruit. I'll have a few berries, three blueberries, (laughs) but I'll have it at night in a granola mix with lots of cream. And so if it's going to make me hungry, the next few hours, those three berries, no, it doesn't. But if it was going, if it was going to have an effect, I'll be asleep. But if I was to have that for breakfast, I will have the munchies. You know, I'll be wanting the snack a few hours time. So I, I'm, I'm now totally aware. If I, if fructose sneaks into my meal, and it does occasionally, I've, I've had some Thai food. I can still remember having a Thai soup. Could not taste any sweetness in it whatsoever. But clearly, it had been covered by other spices. And I lay awake at night completely wired and hungry and purely I'd just been hit, I'd had an out of the, an unexpected sugar hit. Yeah. You know, your description about how we could see food addiction as not actually an addiction driven by dopamine, et cetera, et cetera, but that it is actually a feeding frenzy, natural response to our desire to have fruit. I, I think I, I, I totally get the dopamine aspect of it, all right? Because yeah. there's, a, there's a pleasure response with actually sure. gratifying one's need. Well, 
what was the bright red and the bright orange there's the bright lights in the brain too yeah it, it's it's all but i think I, I personally think that's one step down the pathway i keep i keep trying to i always go back to what's the yeah okay how did we get to do, how did we get to wanting that dopamine yeah it's a, therefore, so because our, our, there wasn't any pleasure in our evolution, I think I think that's the interesting thing. It was a professor up in Scandinavia who told me this thing about bread and beer being the first findings with before our agricultural revolution, like fourteen thousand years ago, fifteen thousand about. And I, I think it's a really interesting concept because it's our first exposure to a food product for hedonistic purposes. So every other food, something that came into our food cycle had an evolutionary benefit. You know, whether or not when we apparently when evolution, we you know, if you believe in all that, we we came from the sea onto the land, and but we, we and we started having all these benefits. But our introduction of agriculture and grains and carbohydrate in our diet have not had a biological advantage to us. They have meant that we've been able to organise ourselves into civilizations, and we have art and science and all of those benefits. Yeah. We've also got violence and we've got law enforcement as a result of our congregations into bigger communities. But if we, our introduction of that was actually probably a, a, a hedonistic pursuit. You know, the benefit, oh, here's some grain that's been lying in a pot of, you know, in some, you know, some area of water that got heat, heated by the sun. I oh, will drink that. And then all of a sudden they were drunk. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm making it up because I wasn't actually there 15,000 years ago. But I mean, you can, there's no evolutionary benefit from us actually moving down the pathway of carbohydrate because, yes, it's better for our storage, fat storage, and it's better for our farming practices because we can actually fat store. But we come with it, it's come with a heavy burden. And a heavy burden is now what we describe as modern disease, inflammation, the whole process. So you know, how, what's, our, what's our answer is to actually, a, a first of all, understand that in our environment, understand it. I mean, I, I missed out on Journal Club last night, but my colleague sent me a picture of a bowl of lollies. I, just, I call that just harassment, but essentially, yeah, so not everyone's on board with this. You know, there's still party food and there's lollies and stuff and everything driving behaviour. But to me, I go, okay, well, good luck to you guys, because I know what that's going to now, now do to you. It's kind of going to drive behaviour. So get educated and then and then make those personal choices based on the education. But if you're also hearing that I'm wrong, I might be wrong, but I'd like to hear why, where you've gotten that information from. And so when I'm told that vegetarianism is the way to go, then I, I know that's wrong because biochemically that's wrong. It just it, it cannot possibly sustain the planet. And when you start, it cannot sustain the people nor the planet. I've just been, finished a book called Apocalypse Never by Michael Schellenberg, who's a, an environmentalist. Hmm. He makes a very, very good argument. So he's an environmentalist and an activist, but he's actually said that the rhetoric has just gone so far over the top that it's not believable. And, and it's, it's a great book because it's, you know, so I, I try and read widely rather than just biochemistry because I'm trying to understand where everyone's getting their opinions from. And so as we enter into these guideline committee pathways which we're in at the moment trying to create change and create a voice for it's really important just to work out where everyone's coming from because okay. it's really hard to really and hard to work you, that out where do you see things moving so i mean you've had your experience of an obstacle that you that actually got resolved that they apparently they you were apologized to but i'm assuming that there's still a lot of resistance where are we on in the battle now it was well, it there's a, there's a battle at a, at a government level there's a battle at a community level there's a battle at an individual level and so i think it's about a supporting each other and so i i think social media is fabulous whilst we still have it mm. it's another topic which you know how much longer will we actually have true free speech and to rally behind each other and support each other i think that's enormous i think getting information which you think is unbiased I, mean, I could be biased as well. I'm not selling anything, but I mean, I'm biased by what's happened to me. My people will say, oh, look, the system came after you. You're a bit bitter and twisted about it. Uh -huh. And I go, well, yes, I am. But I can also see the health benefits of those people that are actually doing what I'm talking about. Yes. So that feedback to me is critical because I know that I'm still on the right pathway. So therefore, I think the individual needs to educate those around them. And so therefore, if you've got an opportunity to tell one or two other people, say, oh, look, I heard Vicky talking about this or that or whatever, Oh, that's interesting. And then it's up to them to go and explore. I do a lot of mentoring of other people who are actually in this space, particularly when they come up against some obstacles, whether or not they're 
hierarchical or they're in fact administrative. They're both, I get calls every single week about that. And so but because I'm so seasoned in that pathway now, I'm actually, mm-hmm. every person who I've been at, who rings me up, I'm able to help them. And it's not just here in Australia, it's internationally. People contact me and say, oh, I've got this problem with the regulator, what do I do? I say, show me your letter, how, did, how have you written it? I suggest how you rewrite it and then I should... I'll tap a bit of wood. I've got a hundred percent success rate of getting everyone off in the last ten That's years. Great. Yeah. And what about it, your orthopedic colleagues? Are they listening? It's a pretty it, traditional it, group. Yeah. You know, so I've tried the full frontal assault on them, and that went down like a lead balloon. And then three years later, because essentially I got up at a knee replacement meeting and told everyone they were over operating. You know. Uh-huh. And right. like I want here. Look, I'm sorry, guys, but I, I want to reduce your income by two thirds. You know, that went down like a lead balloon. But and then I, it, three years later, I was asked to give the same talk again. And uh, at that time, 80% of the audience got it. Uh, I think there is a movement afoot. I, I'm not quite privy to say exactly what we're up to with the, at the, the national body at the moment, but there's moves afoot in the next few years to move us down a more preventative health pathway as an orthopaedic association. I think that's massive. We're doing the same thing with James Mookie, who is uh, an ophthalmologist yeah. and our ex-Australian of the year. James and I do a lot of work together. We're working with national bodies involved in diabetes, cancer, heart disease, renal function, college of GPs. The, the long and short of it, you can't, you can't stop us because we've actually got patients that are actually improving their health, their well-being, taking control, becoming empowered. And that empowerment, so you, you know that when people overcome their food addiction, they, they get it, they get, they, all of a sudden they... they well, I can't think of a better word. They they become empowered once again. And whether or not it's their knowledge or their ability to recognise what's going on around them, they become empowered. And so there's, I think we'll keep seeing the rise and fall of, you know, alternate meats and alternate products and, and different associations. But ultimately, I am bit sound like a, a zealot here, but science will win. Yeah. Biochemistry you just can't change it. You might talk about epigenetics of obesity and whatever, but the basic structure of a cell, the basic fuel into it and the basic requirements doesn't change. And those people who actually have a complete fuel source, I mean, we, I actually think we pay more attention to what fuel we put in our cars and what we put in our bodies. And the moment you start paying equal amount of attention, your, your health's going to improve. That, that, that's it. And so, therefore, that's where the individual, I started this alone, uh, and then, and I, I was asked to speak in, in, a, in, a, in a lounge room with twelve other people, with three speakers to twelve people. Rod Taylor, who started Low Carb Down Under, literally a dozen people in a lounge room in Melbourne. And, and now those those videos have been seen tens of millions of times. So, and again, because I'm allowed to be arrogant because I'm orthopedic surgeon because because we're right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I accept your opinion, but I'm sorry, we're right. You know. It's not just I'm right, it's we're right. Mm. We're, we're talking about something incredibly safe but incredibly emotional and incredibly politicised and monetized. So once you understand that the whole food discussion is about not about science, it's about money and politics and religious fervour, yeah. then you're in the game. I, I, my children, our children, have, have always laugh at Dad because Dad always reads the rule books on how to play scrap, you know, how to play Monopoly and whatever. Did you realise you can do this if you're on the, you know, this, this is the rule. So once you understand the games, the rules of the game, then you can play. And the vast majority of people in this space don't understand what's going on. What's happening? Because it's, I call it non science. You've got science and non science. And non science is spelt very, very similar to nonsense. I, I've just been listening to you guys have this conversation and the whole time I was just thinking, oh, careful guys, we're going to have somebody coming out saying, oh, we're going to cause somebody to have an eating disorder or develop orthorexia because they're paying too much attention to like what they're putting into their body. But I think it goes back to what you were just saying, Dr. Fecky, in, in that like when we look at the science and the biology of it versus the money and like like the smoke screen that's being you know put up and where the money is and where is this like dogma coming from? It, you know, it's the Seventh Day Adventist, you know, formulation of how this should be, and it's who's paying for medical school and who's paying for the med- dietary guidelines, and they're just horrendous in the U.S. and and we keep trying to, you know, write into them and change them. And we're working. I'm on a committee to plead 
with the World Health Organization to add food addiction to the, you know, to the ICD and that kind of thing. And it's everywhere you turn, right? The door is being closed because they just don't want to hear it because there's no science to show any of this yet. We can come up with all these research papers, whether it be about what you're talking about or that food addiction is real or whatever these things. And it's, it's just really interesting, right? How people just want to bury their head in the sand. I think the dietary guidelines, because they become national, international, cross-border policies, and our guidelines for the, the normal population, the two things about normal population, at, ver- at very best, it's two standard deviations. But more importantly, the dietary guidelines, and I'm spending a bit of time on this at the moment, are for the healthy population. Same in the US, they're written for the healthy population. Latest figures out of the US, 93.2% of the population are metabolically unwell, Okay. So therefore, less than seven; those dietary guidelines are applicable to land to less than seven percent of the population. So that's a minority. Let's ignore them. And so therefore, it's a, a fairly simple argument. But that's where I'm heading to say, okay, someone has type two diabetes. Let's give them a specific dietary guideline. Someone has chronic kidney disease. Let's give them a specific dietary guideline. That someone has heart disease. Let's give them a specific dietary guideline. Now, interestingly. And, and cancer, let's give them a specific dietary guideline. All of them have as a central portion is actually insulin resistance, which actually comes from having too much carbohydrate. As it turns out, they all require the same <laughs> dietary input, but we put them under a different banner. This becomes a diet for those with diabetes. This becomes a diet for those with heart disease or cancer or whatever. Can I ask just a question about that real quick? So now, is it just that there's too much carbohydrate or is it the carbohydrate and the seed oils in combination that goes into insulin resistance? Oh, look, I think it's the insulin resistance thing is primarily in current society, a carbohydrate oversupply into the system over a long, long period of time. That becomes an insulin resistance state. And there's a few pathways for that. I think the seed oils create an inflammatory process which then speed up that situation and create individual more organ damage. So they're related, but I think, as I say, the half-life of seed oils is going to be in the measurement of years. The half-life of the carbohydrate is going to be measured in minutes. So the thing that you can actually turn around today, this afternoon, is to reduce your carbohydrate intake. You have total control of that and make alternate choices which are going to be about complete healthy proteins and fats. So I, I think, again, that's what the, the tools you've got to give people. So are you got to, are you, you're going to get better in four years' time isn't as good an incentive as you're going to lose your osteoarthritis pain in a week. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because we've all got goldfish mentalities, and, I need, and we're all <laughs> food addicts, so we need instant gratification for dopamine. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've definitely taken up more than enough of your time. So I've got two final questions for you. The first is, what's next for you? Look, strangely enough, it's golf. And I realize golf is a ridiculous game. However, it is one of the very few things in life that you can do that you are completely and utterly responsible for the outcomes of your actions. There's so many things we do, so many times when you're going to a committee and you're arguing and you want to, your pathway is determined by the action and inaction of others. And it can drive you insane being like that. So the great thing about golf is I actually... I'm completely responsible. So, I mean, I, I jokingly say, but I think it's philosophically in, in some way something because the more I spend in this space, even though I know that we're making progress, I'm frustrated at how slow it is. And I've got a, a meeting later this morning here where we're going to be. Like, the only way to change guidelines is to actually get in there and get your, get your hands dirty. And I'm pretty thick-skinned on that, but we've been doing it for a long time. It does get frustrating. And so it's very much important supporting and mentoring others. And, and, and so I, we're, we're, we're to now more and more mentoring, more and more mm-hmm. discussions like this, because you guys are on the same, you know, we're on the same journey. Mm-hmm. It, we've got slightly different tax on it, but we're all heading in that same pathway. How do we get people healthier? How do we let people know that they can become healthier? How do we take them away from the mainstream guidelines and media, which is actually swamping them with disinformation? I call that deliberate misinformation. And therefore, that, that having a chat to you ladies is, is part of that. Well, we Thank certainly you. appreciate it. Yeah, we certainly appreciate you being here. We have one last question. We have a signature question we ask everybody. So if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about carbohydrate addiction or food addiction or just, you know, diabetes or metabolic dysfunction, any of those things, 
in general? Like, what would it be? What would you tell just a younger version of yourself about what you know now? Oh, don't listen to your medical textbooks, number one, and eat <laughs> fresh local seasonal whole food based on your environment right. and culture, avoiding <laughs> added sugar and processed food. I mean, I, I was clearly, my mum died young, dad was travelling a lot. We ate addictive food, my sister and myself. I used to have four litres of ice cream, you know, a gallon of ice cream every week, mm. and then I'd run it off. I, I was incredible. I'm, I'm already. I'm still a little bit plethoric, but I used to be bright red, as bright red as your top there. You know, I, I was inflamed. I think my joints were inflamed. You know, I, I was on a pathway, but I was doing what I was told, and so therefore, I live by that analogy of questioning everything. It drives others around me who love me quite insane at times, including Belinda. But I said, "Why are you doing that?" I said, "It's, it's not right. I'm going to do it." I said, "I'm going to do this. I'm going down." The road less travelled is the, is the one um, is often the more exciting one. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Fetke. I have to say that the thing that I loved about what you said today was empty the pantry and fill the fridge. Love that. Anyway, you had some great quotes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that's Karen Zins. That's not mine, but I, oh, it's well, well worth well, requoting. I like what you said too. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.